For today's Patently Strategic Podcast, we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, James Howard is a college professor, design historian, entrepreneur, industrial designer, inventor, and restauranteur. Uh, he brings over 25 years of experience as a design professor and has authored a course on design thinking and design history that explores the impact of design on society. As an accomplished industrial design educator and entrepreneur, uh, James has lectured on the experience of Black American inventors. Howard himself is an extraordinary inventor who has 20 patents, uh, many covering innovations that save people's lives every day. James is the founder and executive director of the Black Inventors Hall of Fame, and we could not be more thrilled to have him joining us today. Uh, welcome, James, and thanks for carving out some time from a no doubt busy schedule to chat with us. Thank you. It is my absolute pleasure to be joining you, Josh. Yeah, uh, it's just go, going through the going through the list. Professor, historian, entrepreneur, industrial designer, inventor, restaurant too. Uh, really, really glad, really glad that there's an opportunity in there for uh, for podcast guest as well too. Because uh, yeah, that's a that sounds like quite that sounds like quite a schedule. So, um, you know, the first question, you know, I sort of like to you know do things kind of chronologically sometimes. Uh, just. You know, we've got a lot of inventors in the in the audience. Could you tell us a little bit about your origin story as an inventor? Sure. Uh, well, it kind of begins with my very first job right out, uh, out of grad school. Uh, I went to work for a company that uh, is the leading manufacturer of ADL equipment. That is AIDS for daily living. And in that experience was the opportunity to often meet with individuals who were inventing gadgets and products to help to aid their loved ones, you know, reaching AIDS, feeding AIDS, dressing AIDS, things of that nature. So I had a chance to work directly with these individuals and the company would often uh, buy the idea and then get a patent on it. So I would have to turn that idea, that raw idea into a manageable, you know, product uh, and then translate that into a patent. So my first seven or eight patents were all in the field of ADA, AIDS for daily living, and everything from spoon AIDS that aid you in self-feeding to reading AIDS that aid you in turning pages with your head uh, automatically and things of that nature. So that's that was my entree into invention. And then from there, I uh, decided that I needed to open up my own design firm because I wanted to expand my horizons. So I went into starting Howard Design in, in 1987. And from there, opened up a whole world of opportunity for invention. In fact, one of my very first inventions uh, under the moniker of Howard uh, Design was a neonatal pressure relief valve, um, which went on to uh, become one of the leading pressure relief valves of its kind in the entire world. And it was the first pressure relief valve that was single use uh, disposable. So that means every single time that you use this valve on a child to resuscitate an infant at birth, you would just throw the valve away. And unfortunately, when I learned of this opportunity, the company had mentioned to me, Vital Science had mentioned to me that prior to this particular uh, invention, Every valve that was ever made was made of uh, high precision stainless steel. And each and every time they would have to use one of these valves in the emergency setting, they would then have to send it down to get it sterilized, right? So I learned, Josh, of horror stories where just when the valve was needed most, oh, sure. there were none available. They were all being sterilized. And so doctors and nurses, practitioners would have to literally hand prime the pump. And unfortunately, with infants, particularly preemies, if you hand prime the pump too much, you can collapse the lungs. Yeah. And if you don't open up enough airways of oxygen, then you can give, make the brain uh, deprived of oxygen and you can have brain deficiencies and so forth. So this valve was absolutely critical. Yeah, that's just, I mean, it's just an, an amazing story, um, you know, just of, of how how inventions, you know, really run the, run the gamut of, of of things that impact our our daily lives, you know, in such in yeah. such profound ways. And, you know, I mean, something like that's especially so, um, 
Because like you said, I mean, that's that's such an urgent situation. You don't you don't have time to wait for something to come back from um from, from cleaning. And so it's just um yeah, that's 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 remarkable. And um, you know, it has to be, I don't know, it has to be very gratifying to sort of even just think about the number of lives that you know you, you positively impacted um with with that. So it's very, very cool. Thank you. Thank you. From there, I also went on to design a whole host and get patents on cardiovascular delivery systems, every, everything from stent crimping devices responsible for crimping a stent onto a balloon catheter to a septal closure device responsible for closing up uh, holes in infants' hearts. Uh, so it, just, it has just run the whole gamut. And it, and it kind of falls in line with my basic philosophy. I'm a, my mission in life, and that is to serve others. And I figured if God's going to give me the talent to be creative and to do these innovative types of outputs, that it should have more of a slant of serving others as opposed to self-gratification and so forth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, hmm. So we, you know, we we sort of um, crossed paths originally at the the U.S. Inventor Conference. Um, mm -hmm. You also told a, I thought was a, a really great story about um, about your granddaughter, I believe it was, and mm -hmm. a, a, lock, a lock that you a lock that you had invented. Could you could you tell us a little bit about that one yeah. too? Yeah, it was actually pretty neat. It was uh, not this past Thanksgiving, but the prior one in two thousand twenty two. And uh, what uh, we had done right after uh, eating dinner at my daughter's house in Pennsylvania, I decided to take my grandkids to the local Barnes and Noble and while, to buy them their first Christmas gift for the season, right? Uh, this is Black Friday. And uh, while we're there in the toy section and the learning you know, kids section and all of that, I look over to the right and I happen to see one of my patented products, right? An access control lock that I uh, did uh, for a company of alarm lock. And it happened to be the first access control lock in the country that actually had a mechanical override. So just in case the power went down and everything, you can just push the buttons and it actuated mechanically and so forth and was battery operated. Anyway, so I see the lock. And I see my three grandkids and I make a connection. I look to my right, there's the lock on the door. I look to my left, there are my three grandkids flocking over toys. So I call them all over to the door and uh, I say, look guys, this is a great moment. I'd like for you to stand right here and take a look. And I took a picture. Now my granddaughter up until that point didn't even know that granddad was an inventor. My youngest granddaughter had no clue what an inventor was. Uh -huh. But my oldest grandson, Aiden, he goes with me everywhere, and he has seen this lock a million times. <laughs> so as I'm gathering them all around the lock, he's going, oh, granddad, not again, right? <laughs> so take the picture. I purchased, you know, all the toys for them and everything. But right there in that moment, my granddaughter, my oldest granddaughter started saying, granddad, granddad, what does an inventor do? What do they do? How do they invent, you know? Uh, do they get rich? You know, <laughs> how do they do it? How do they do it? And so I started explaining to her right there in the moment. I said, "Listen, you got to begin with research." She goes, "Well, can I invent a toy?" I say, "Yes, you can if you put your mind to it." She says, "How do I do it? How do I do it?" Mm -hmm. I say, "Well, you start researching." So they started researching. They started going to this shelf and that shelf and looking at the details and asking questions. How will I improve it? So forth. And then we left. We got in the car, it's about a 20 minute ride back to the house. And during that entire 20 minutes, my granddaughter is grilling me on what it takes to be an inventor, right? What it takes to be an inventor. And by the time we get home, that's all she wants to do. So naturally, her younger sister joined on board and my reluctant, adamant grandson <laughs> came on board. And they spent the rest of the evening inventing a product. And if you don't mind, I'd like to go right over to the table and show it to you. Yeah, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Take two seconds. Sure. They ended up spending the rest of the day in Benning Slap Happy. My grandkids right there. Oh, that's great. The tagline says, the childhood game that explodes with excitement. And what it does is really clever. You just do a, uh, have a stack of cards in the middle of the floor and... When you flip them over and a match occurs, the 
first person to slap down on those cards get that set. All right. And then we factored in other components that just makes it so intriguing. And uh, so, yeah, so right now we're trying to put that on a pathway, but I'm using it more as a learning experience for them. Sure. Now, right. So I'll be entering them into a pitch competition. Can you imagine that? An 11 year old and a nine year old pitching slap happy, right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, just well, an amazing. I mean, it's so, so, so neat too, for them to, um, you know, and this is something you, you saw earlier on in, in, in your career of, you know, sort of like idea to commercialization and really, you know, seeing that, seeing that end to end, um, you know, is very, very, very empowering, but you know, the, oh, yeah. like the, the whole, the whole, the whole thing's a, the whole thing's a wonderful, um, a wonderful story. I think that the, the part that, the part that I love so much about it, um, and that just really gravitated to and when you're talking about a US inventor is just like what a moment of inspiration sort of that yeah. that was in you know in a in a child's in a child's life you know i mean that yeah. that that could be like a like a life de- like a like a life defining um yeah. a life defining moment uh and to make to make sort of what you had done tangible uh you know in in that way and i wasn't actually i wasn't even going to talk about this until later but i i you know i watched your um uh, we'll talk more about this in, in a little, in a little bit. But I watched your, you know, Black Inventors Got Game uh, documentary, you know, this morning. And uh, you know, Lonnie, Lonnie Johnson had, I had this great quote. I wrote it down. I loved, it. I loved it. He said, you know, what they see, they will be. And yep. and it was like what, what you, what happened there with the lock and everything that ensued, up, you know, up to the board game and where they are today is, you know, an absolute real world manifestation, you know, of of that. So just. Just a, just a wonderful, just a wonderful story. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And this is why it's so important for us as adults to serve as mentors and do just as much of a job of listening to our kids, you know, as opposed to lecturing to them and advising them. Yeah. Listen to what motivates them. Listen to what they really, you know, are passionate about and concerned about. And like with my granddaughter, um, Kara, it only took that one little spark of curiosity to center yeah. on that pathway. Yeah. And I'll add this added an antidote. She was so driven by this whole world of invention that she started researching other black innovators of the past. And she stumbled upon this one particular innovator by the name of Alice Ball. Okay. And Alice Ball's story is somewhat sad because it uh, started with her inventing a method for eradicating, uh, for, for, uh, for managing leprosy. And so her delivery system was the first effective way to manage leprosy. This was in the early 1900s. And while she's in grad school and she's patenting and, and getting all of her work done in this process called the ball method, you know, she's been very successful. She's been applauded and lauded and everything. And suddenly, unfortunately, she has an incident in the lab and she dies. A year later, a year after inventing this ball method, right? So upon her death, the head of the school decided to take full credit for her work and rename the method the Dean Method. And for over a hundred years, the Dean Method had been credited with the work of Alice Ball. And just recently, within the last couple of years, the University of Hawaii has set the record straight and has given her all of her due diligence and claim to being the pioneer for managing uh, this dreadful disease. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so again, it only takes that one spark of uh, inspiration, then you start researching. And Josh, plain and simply, this is why my mission is so important, You know, to have a place where kids of all persuasions and ages can just go and be inspired you know, to become yeah. the next great scientists and doctors and engineers. I, I suspected this was going to be a good segue to that to that next question. So, I mean, you you know, you you founded the Black Inventors Hall of Fame. What were uh, what was your what were your drivers for that? What's your what's your mission? Your goals? What are you hoping to accomplish? Well, you know, interesting enough, the, the catalyst was me constantly seeing our story being suppressed, and and that's not hyperbole. It has truly been suppressed and. And 28 days of the month, of the year, once a year, just isn't enough 
right, to give full justification to that storyline. And so the real true catalyst was one day uh, I was in the supermarket looking through a Time Magazine special article called America's Top 100 Inventors, right? And they cover the whole art from day one all the way up into 2016, our top 100 inventors. So they have on the front cover, they have Thomas Edison, they have Elijah Gray, they have uh, Alexander Graham Bell, they have Henry Ford, heck, they even had Steve Jobs on there, right? And all of these faces, and I'm saying, wait a minute, I don't see a single black face on there. So I'm okay with that, Josh, but I decided that I'm going to open it up and okay, at least I'll see, you know, a couple in there, right? Not a single one, not a zero. And that kind of stayed with me, Josh, for four years. That stayed with me. It stuck with me and it bothered me. I'm not going to kid you. So the catalyst was one night I am looking at uh, on, on the computer. This is during COVID when we were all you know in the homes. And I'm looking at the grand opening of the National the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm looking at that grand opening, which was on the lawn in Washington, D.C. Yep. Obama was in office. And so they had all of these celebrities and notorieties and government officials come and praise the museum and so forth and so forth. And for three full hours, there's storyline and storyline about acknowledging our enslaved past acknowledging our civil rights past, acknowledging our sports past and our entertainment past, not a single word mentioned about our illustrious innovation and inventive past. True. Not a one, not a one. I was determined that night to do something about that. Yeah. And it just so happened, Josh, I was being interviewed just like this. Yep. I was being interviewed by a gentleman by the name of David Caldwell, uh, Daryl Caldwell, rather, Dell. And at the end of the interview, Dell had asked me, he says, you know what, Mr. Howard, you know so much about African-American inventor history and so much about this and so much about that. He says, have you ever thought about opening up a Black Inventors Hall of Fame? And those words just resonated, man. Three yeah. months later, we were opening up. So that's, that's, how, that's the total origin of Black Inventors Hall of Fame. And now we're on the destiny to open up the first and only museum in the country dedicated exclusively to immortalizing the pioneering genius of African-American inventors for the past 400 years. Yeah, that's it's great. And it's, you know, what what you noticed, I think, little, little, you know, commentary for me, I guess, but uh, was a huge opportunity, a huge missed opportunity, I think, for, you know, for others, especially um, in an opportunity to celebrate that that convergence, like with the accessibility of the of the patent system, you know. So I mean, like we're we're obviously very biased. We we love we love patents, but one of the things that we really really love about patents is you know we started digging more and more into the you know the historical roots of of these things, and mm -hmm. one of the things that jumps off from the the earliest the earliest pages is the accessibility of the system, like the you know the 1790 Patent Act you know, talked about, you know, granting exclusive rights to um, inventors. And, and they and they said, you know, he, she, and, and, and they, and didn't explicitly, you know, exclude um, minorities, people of color, or anything at a, at a time when, when women and people of color couldn't vote, couldn't own property. Here was this mm -hmm. patent system that mm -hmm. was, that was, you know, accessible to all in, in, in ways that tragically, unfortunately, other things at the time were, were not. And yeah. so there's, there's a really interesting convergence of things here that's really worth calling out and celebrating. Well, it's interesting you would state that. Uh, I want to double down on that a little bit and uh, make note to the audience that, um, yes, you are correct. The accessibility was there. But unfortunately, during that time, slaves were not allowed to attain patents because they were not considered citizens. So those who did, in fact, uh, that are of uh, African-American persuasion, who did attain patents were freedmen. In fact, the very first black man to ever achieve a patent was Thomas Jennings in 1821 because he was a freedman. He was up in New York and he invented dry cleaning. He invented dry cleaning. Uh, but the paper trail is, is very thin on yeah. all those others who were denied patents. And the most noted story I'll tell you very briefly is that of Benjamin Montgomery, 
okay. who was uh, enslaved to Joseph Davis. And the, Joseph is the, uh, the brother of Jefferson Davis. And Benjamin Montgomery designed and improved a steam propeller that helped to revolutionize that industry at the time, literally. Uh -huh. And it was so effective that when he was denied his patent because he was a slave, Joseph Davis attempted to patent it. And even the patent office said no to that because, again, it was originated by a slave. So, you know, those storylines were steep and rich, and, and, and it's my job to try to go and uncover more of those so that we can complete the entire story arc. Do you realize the very first um, African-American woman to ever receive a patent didn't even sign her name in her name. She signed it with an X. She signed it with an X. Her name was Judy Reed. Okay. And she got a patent on a knee dole, a knee doler that, that needs dough, a mechanical knee doler. Yep. And uh, when she signed it with an X, um, it has been determined by many pundits that the reason she signed it with an X was because she was illiterate. However, I also seem to think that there's a great chance she signed it with an X was because if she had intended on receiving franchise from this Doe Needler, mm -hmm. that if it had been known that the product had come and been invented by a colored woman or a black woman, it may not have been well received by its audience, right? right. And we know that to be a fact because Ellen Eglin, who had invented a clothes wringer that revolutionized the laundry industry at that time, she was a domestic servant from Washington, D.C. She invented this clothes wringer and sold it for $18, $18 to a white agent. He went on to make riches from it by selling it to the licensing of it to three other manufacturers. And Ellen Eglin got $18. Fast forward 10 years later when she's been interviewed by a uh, women's magazine called Women Innovators, she said, as this, and I quote, they asked her, why did you sell your ringer for just $18 when it made so much money? And she goes, well, you know that I'm black. She says, and if it had been known that a colored woman had invented this product, white women would not have purchased it. That is why I sold it for $18. So that's just an example of our story and why these stories are so important to connect and get out to the public so that, you know, future generations of uh, innovators can be inspired, inspired. Uh, by yep. their perseverance. Yep. Yep. Ab absolutely. Um, and I want to, I want to go, you know, even a little bit deeper on that if, if we could. So, you know, mm -hmm. a, a new, a new format that we've started in the podcast centers around um, inventor stories, you know, uh, mm -hmm. which is something that we've absolutely loved doing. We've gotten really great feedback on it. Um, since it's Black History Month, and since I cannot imagine a better person to ask this question than the man trying to shine more light um, on the very important aspects of that history, um, could you tell us about a couple of inventors that impact daily life, but um, you know whose whose inventors are just not yet household names? You know, uh, yes, yes, I can. But I'd like to begin with one who is tangibly connected to something that we do daily as we travel. And that is, as you go to airports and you hop on a plane, you hop off of a plane. Well, as you know, the airplane was pretty much initiated at the turn of the century when much of the world had its eyes on taking flight. It wasn't just here in this country. Other yeah. parts of the world were racing to uh, get patents on, on taking flight. And as you know, the Wright brothers were working towards that as well. But a little known fact is that there is a black man by the name of Charles Frederick Page who was born into slavery, was self-taught, raised 11 kids, and he was a carpenter by trade, raised 11 kids. Well, he had joined that race and he had sought to seek franchise from a competition that was going on in um, Louisiana, uh, not uh, St. Louis actually, the Louisiana Exposition. So he designed and built an airship and patented it. And he received his patent one month before the Wright brothers received their patent. No kidding. 
but yet you never hear of Charles Frederick Page. It's one of the original aviation pioneers. So what I try to tell people in my community is don't go around saying a black man invented an airplane. That's not the point. That's not the story. No one would ever claim that. What we're claiming is that when we're talking about aviation pioneers in this country, that he needs to be part of the discussion. Sure. Absolutely. His patent preceded the Wright Brothers patent by one month. And Josh, I'm going to be building a full-size replica of his uh, airship and um, having it on display at the museum, at the Black and Veterans Hall of Fame Museum. I'm working closely with the family. There's only one person still on the face of this earth that is was actually around uh, before he died. And this is his cousin. And this guy was 10 years old at the time when Charles Frederick Page died. And so we're interviewing him and we're going to get that story out. Charles Frederick Page, the unknown aviation pioneer. So that's one example. But another example, for instance, on the flip side of that, is the work of Dr. Hedalia Nicole Green. And Dr. Hedalia Nicole Green has a patent on a nanotechnology for eradicating cancer that few in the world in the medical community knows about, right? And you and I both know the ravages of cancer. It is just something that someday the, the innovative genius of all mankind is gonna venture to get to a point of eradicating said cancer. Well, Dr. Nicole Hedalia Green is on the precipice of doing just that, yet she is struggling for getting the proper financing she needs. Uh, and uh, she took the route of Elijah J. McCoy, and Granville T. Woods, and Henry Boyd, all prior African-American inventors of the past during the golden era. And that is when no one wants to sort of like invest in you, you invest in yourself. So sure. she started her own, uh, she started her own research um, facility and, and is really about to do some amazing things in that area. So you got aviation and you have cancer. I can't think of any more important things that impacts our lives on a daily basis, you know, yeah. than those two things. And um, it's, just, it's just amazing me. The things that we've accomplished that just have gone unknown. Yeah. And and uh, yeah. so. Well, I mean, and that's that's something we're, you know, we're happy to more than happy to raise, you know, aware, awareness around. You know, we I was actually just um I was actually just having a conversation with somebody about this the other day. You know, there's 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 things that sort of we take for granted in our daily life because they're problems that were solved by past generations. And we we didn't we never felt the we never felt the pain of these things we were kind of just born into the convenience of the, of the solution. And there are a lot of things that don't kill people anymore because we have, we have medical solutions for, for them. And it yep, seems, yep. you know, in retrospect, like a, like a, like a silly way to die. And that's like, that's my biggest, one of my biggest hopes, if not my biggest hope for the future is that at some point in our lives or at minimum in my kids' lives, that they're going to be able to look back and have that conversation about, about cancer, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, it's yeah. tragic that people don't have to die that way in yeah. a, anymore, yeah. and that and that they can get to the point of taking whatever that treatment is, what you know, yeah. nanotechnology, like that they can start taking it for granted in the way that we take so many of these innovations for for granted that you know that make our lives so much better. So well spoken, so so well spoken, and that moment's gonna come, Josh. Yeah, it's absolutely gonna come. Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, we. We applaud applaud our efforts and um yeah happy to do anything we can to to help get the help get the word out. Thank you. Um next question. So, you know, I I know you're working with some very inspiring young inv inventors. Um you'd brought a gentleman by the name of Nathaniel Smith with you to the conference that uh the US Inventor Conference. And um, we've chatted with him since. Incredibly impressive um young man. Drawing from both, you know, your experiences as a successful inventor and now as a mentor of the next generation of inventors, you know, what advice would you give to those dreaming to change the world, but perhaps struggling to get that initial so important foothold? My advice would be to borrow from the lessons of the past, borrow from the perseverance that Elijah J. McCoy showed when he tried time and time again to sell his lubricating cup 
to people and no one wanted to buy it, yet they knocked it off anyway. You know, borrow from that level of perseverance and whatever you do, don't let anyone, let anyone change your trajectory. Set in your mind that you are going to achieve and just keep moving forward, keep moving forward. And that's this old adage uh, in my space of design thinking, Josh just says, if you are going to fail, if you are going to fall, fall forward, right? And if you're going to fail, embrace failure as learning. So I would encourage all of these young aspiring innovators to embrace failure as learning. So to take every step of that, right? And factor that in to learn how to sort of re-navigate, reboot, and, and go back at it. But whatever you do, don't let anyone change your trajectory. And I'll close with the advice of the old great uh, soulful singing legend, John Legend. He, uh, he advises kids that when you hear no, take it as no for now. <laughs> no for now. So yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I, that you know that that never you know that always listening to your internal compass is is huge. I'm, um, so I'm reading this I'm reading a book right now. It's called the the Hidden Habits of Genius, and it explores mm-hmm. you know, attributes of genius over the over the centuries. And um, I don't have this quote exactly exactly right, but the the essence of it's there. Um, so you know, Pablo Pablo Picasso, um, parents were supportive of his art but not the mm-hmm. manifestation of his art so his father mm-hmm. was his father was very 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 strict about how he painted and, yep. and and he said your painting needs to be more realistic it needs yep. to be more lifelike and he got yep. that beat into his head and so as an as an adult he said that he spent his entire childhood learning how to paint like an adult and he spent his entire adulthood trying to learn how to paint like a child Oh, yeah. Right. And so, you know, sometimes you're born into a supportive environment that's, that says, oh, yeah, maybe this kid's on to something different. And sometimes mm-hmm. and sometimes you're not. But like, you know, hold hold true. If that if that inner compass is pointing strongly in a in a direction, like do not be easily de- detoured. Be deterred. No. Picasso held true and he got his greatest fulfillment in that latter part of his life where he was exploring his inner self and following that compass, you know, yeah. that led him to the yeah. discovery is one of the greatest painters of all time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. Love that. Love that story. Well, it's just so so much of genius is not r- recognized by the immediate peer group surrounding the genius either, right? Um, and that's, well, that's- you know, I, I often tell kids that when you have a great idea, oftentimes you find yourself being the minority of one because yeah. people can't don't always get it. Don't expect the folks to always get it, you know, and that's the sign of true genius. Yeah, yeah. Where, where you, you are sort of, you know, that lone genius in some respects because the others just don't get it, but don't let that deter you and just keep moving forward. And I tell you, there's so much hope and promise right now for today's youth. Yeah, uh, This is why I'm leading research right now in STEM education. I'll be heading up a STEM summit in the late fall of this year that will bring together uh, all the significant uh, STEMpreneurs of color in this entire country, we're going to come together in Washington, D.C. and have a summit to discuss just that, you know, some of the best practices of how to reach these kids, how to reach all kids, but a specific focus on underserved youth yeah. and, and, and how to put together curricula and programs and talking points that are really going to just, you know, make a difference and make the greatest and pay the greatest, you know, return on investment. So, yeah, you know, that's going to take place in the fall of uh, of this year. That's I'll great. let you know the date, in fact. And if you want to come and take a few talking heads for that, man, you'd be more than welcome. Oh, please, you know please, please do. Um, I think it's I think it's so important. And you know, it's an interesting intersection of um of this generation being born at a time when the technology is so much more accessible now than what it than what it used to be and and you know and in, in engaging like you know yeah. like the 
I, I, I work on like a lot of robotics kits and stuff with, mm-hmm. you know, with, mm-hmm. with our, with our son um, and our, you know, and our daughter. And like, these mm-hmm. are things that we can literally go to our public library and check out for a couple of weeks and play with on their, on their iPad using like drag and drop blocks of, you know, code and little, mm-hmm. little Lego robots and stuff. It's like, it's, it, and I just, I can't wait to see, what that gives rise to from that's the generation that's like yes. it's going to be so equipped you know well you, you know yeah. interesting enough we're seeing some samples of that right now in real time yeah you know the young man uh, just of a month or two back he was anointed the uh the young uh scientist of the year award he's 14 years old you hear about <laughs> this young man's story 14 years old and he designed and patented it a uh, soap, uh, uh, a bacterial soap that fights, can't remember exactly what it fights, but it does a serious job. And he has a patent on it. And, he, and the science industry just anointed him the Young Scientist of the Year, 14 years old. I got to reach out to this young man and get him featured on my website. And then we have such young men like this. This young man here is Dijon Strickland. Okay. I met him a couple of years ago while doing my big tour in Kansas City. He was only 12 at the time. And this young man impressed me so much with the line of questions that he had at the end of the uh, talk. He went on to develop his own book called Tech Boy, right? So Uh this talks about kids growing up and learning how to do things with technology that is going to help improve people's lives. And you know what Dijon is doing now? He has started his own missionary work of providing lunches to the kids in the neighborhood who don't have enough money to eat yeah. regular nutrition meals each day in school. So he's just a remarkable gentleman, but that is a young man who's inspired by innovation, but further inspired to channel that energy into doing something now. And you yeah. know that old, that old uh, adage about go to school, get a good job, Go to college. When you graduate, you know, you can start doing something. Today's kids are saying, why do I have to wait? I can exactly. contribute now. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. And your kids can contribute now. My granddaughter and grandsons can contribute contributing now. now. Yep. Yep. And this is their moment. It is truly their moment. We will get it. We is that is that book available for purchase? Uh-huh. Yes, it is. Okay, okay good. I will um I'll I'll make sure to get a link to that in the uh in the sh- in the show notes and our, our write up on uh, watchdog for this. Too. Boy. He's he's a remarkable young man. Absolutely remarkable young man, Dejan Strickland. That's fantastic. Maybe we need to consider doing like a a, a young inventors episode sometime. That'd be I can I can help direct you to a couple of men that would just knock your socks off across the board. These young kids today are doing some amazing work. They really are. Uh, Another conference I'm sitting in on um, in August, um, in fact, at the same spot where I first met you, uh, is Invent Ed. I'm going to be one of the panelists uh, in a special session on just that. You know, where are present day, you know, generators of of, um, the next generation of of innovators? You know, Mm -hmm. we're talking, we're not even talking John's age. We're talking my granddaughter's age and her sister's age. Yeah. You know, where how can we how can we feel them? How can we encourage them and just set them on a pathway that even if they don't necessarily stay within the field of innovation, they have adopted certain attributes and skill sets, mm. right? That mm. would just be a positive role model in all endeavors of life, right? Yeah. And I and I just think innovation and creative thinking. And the ability to solve problems and identify problems, all of that is part of the equation that I believe the next generation is going to do probably a slightly better job than we've done. Well, yeah, because I mean, there's a there's a positive contagiousness to that that I like, you know, you really there's a huge psychological component to it. I think especially Mm -hmm. with I mean, with kids, it it never really ends regardless of the age group, but especially with kids. It's like, you know, you see the firstborn, they're kind of having to figure everything out on their on their own. And maybe they don't have a lot of other kids around. But then, mm-hmm. like, you know, the, the kids that follow, they they see other people that are pretty close to their age and size doing these things. And so, mm-hmm. you know, they're sort of driven to do them even sooner because it feels safer 
it's more it's more approachable right like i i see someone more like me you know doing it and so um you know the exponential effects that that could have like on a societal scale are just you know it's really cool yeah yeah awesome um so next question uh you know patent focus patents are our focus uh you have 20 of them uh, I'd love to ask how they have helped on your journey. On my journey, as, as looking back, particularly starting now and then looking back, I get nothing but great fulfillment when I'm with my grandkids, as exemplified in my prior story, and I'm able to show them and point to a wall, paper towel dispenser that's in most Dunkin' Donuts across the country uh, that granddad has a patent on access control lock. So being able to tell those stories immediately to my grandkids are great. But then you get further uh, fulfillment when you know that there are some products out there, though they've been retooled and, re and improved and all of that, they set that industry on a pathway, right? We're just better and more superior types of uh, delivery systems that can help continue to save people. But at the same time, that journey hasn't always been smooth and fulfilling. And I want to share with the audience one brief story about how a product that I got a patent on for a design patent on for a lollipop blow dryer, it was actually taken and stolen and, 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 and given credit to a white design firm that told the, uh, uh, the engineering company that I was an imposter and that I did not invent the product, right? So can you imagine having having your competitors tell someone that you're trying to hit up for a, a contract? And this company is called uh, Dranitz, so it was an electrical engineering company. We were on the verge of signing a huge contract. It was in excess of $100,000 to design a line of elect electrical gadgetry and what have you. And the director uh, who was working with me, the director of engineering, he calls me up one day, uh, you know, with the contract in hand, by the way, just hadn't been signed. He calls them and he goes, James, I'm sorry, man, we're going to back off. We're going to back off of this. I say, what do you mean? He says, well, we just left right, a competing agency because he was still doing his due diligence. Mm -hmm. And we saw your blow dryer up on the mantle. And I say, what do you mean you saw my blow dryer on the mantle? He says, yeah, we saw your blow dryer on the mantle. <laughs> and the company tells me that you didn't design that, that blow dryer. And that you are an imposter and that you're lying and you're making the story up. And I'm saying, oh, oh, my goodness, are you kidding? Not again. And so I offered to show him a copy of the patent, which I did. Back then, we were still faxing, right? Everything sure. was down big fax. So I faxed him a copy of my patent. Here it is. My name across the top. James Howard. Carol Dazzle will dry. A nice, beautiful rendering of the ink, rendering of the patent on the front cover. The whole nine yards. Yep. This was the response that I got. He goes, well, you know what, James? I see you got the, you know, you got the proof here, blah, blah, blah. He goes, but tell you the truth, I don't know who to believe. Now, let that marinate for a moment. Even when you get the goods, and that has been, right, pretty much the script of our mm -hmm. story over 400 years, even when you get the goods, still not good enough. And that just rubbed me in such a way, Josh, that yeah. I'm saying myself, from moving forward, I am just not going to allow this image, this persuasion of the African American, American creative being inferior to and therefore not as credible as you know their white counterparts and that stuck with me that drove me this this happened back in the uh, early 90s around 94 and and ever since that moment uh, that's when I took to the lecture circuit of, of lecturing on uh, the experiences of black inventors because it happened to me. I was discredited and I showed the total proof that I was the only inventor of that product, and yet it wasn't good enough. Yeah, I'm really sorry I had to go through all that, especially, you know, um <laughs> someone who's an established inventor, you know. What I mean, it wasn't your it wasn't even your first patent, right? No, it wasn't my you first know, patent. You, you had a you you had a you had a you had a, you had a, you had a track record, <laughs> right? Um, thank you. 
I did. I had I had already done the valve that I told you about. I had already yeah. done the lock that I told you about, and the paper towel dispenser. All of these were things that uh, had already proven. But yet, when it comes down to having to make a decision on why would a competitor lie about this guy and this competitor, by the way, I'm not going to give the name of the company, but this competitor was from New York, had been in business for over 30 years. And yet somehow, some way they mistakenly, mistakenly thought that the blow dryer they had up on their mantle was theirs when it wasn't theirs. I won't even get into the details as to how they would go about mistaking my blow dryer. The important thing is that even with the proof, even with having the goods and the solid foundation and proof that you're the only inventor of that particular item, it still wasn't good enough. And my friend, I can assure you that that has happened countless times yeah. over the past 400 years to inventors and innovators of my persuasion. Uh, you just don't. The credibility, the uh, the acceptance thereof, and who knows, Josh, it may just give uh, some justification for just why I never did contact Time Magazine the way I planned on, but it might just give some justification for why in this big, thick article that they do, special feature uh, magazine they do on 100 top innovators and inventors in this country, not a single one in there was black except two who, as I told you before, were in the bottom right-hand corner and very small captains, and each one of them could pass for white. So to me, that's like adding insult to injury that even when we are recognized, you, you know, that there can be just some per some perception, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Some perception of, you know, that darker melanin just not being equated and connected to the innovative pipeline. And, and, and it's just so true. And this is why I'm motivated to open up the Black and Business Hall of Fame, the Museum and STEAM Learning Center. Yeah, I mean, I think you're gonna be, I, I think you're gonna change the, the pages. On Thank the, you. On the magazine. I hope so. I really, I, I, I really hope so. I appreciate that, Josh. Um, James, you've been really generous with your time. Do you, can, I, can I ask you two more questions? By all means, please do. Okay. Um, so earlier, you know, in the discussion, um, I mentioned you did a documentary, um, I think in 21, it looked like it was based on some of the filming. It looked like you were, you were dealing with the, uh, oh, more difficult elements of the pandemic for logistics, um, uh, for sure. So your, your documentary, Black Inventors Got Game, um, you had all of these, you know, incredible inventors in, in in one you know in one place i mean just to just to name a couple uh it was you know lonnie johnson was there inventor of, of the uh, super stoker and nerf gun over 300 billion worldwide um sales you had uh, uh ken johnson there the inventor of phase 10 which as i understand is the second most popular selling card game of mm -hmm. all time it a really really great collection of individuals uh you know all together in one place at one time um Two-part question. First, uh, how cool was that? And second, as a you know, a lifelong student and teacher, um, I'm sure you were taking notes. Uh, what were your what were your big takeaways from hanging out with those guys? Oh man. First of all, it was great. I was floating on clouds, man. And on that great day, I had the pleasure of actually greeting each one of these men at the airport as they came in. And I wanted that to be the beginning of the storyline. And these are pioneers. These are unknown, short of money. These are unknown pioneers in the toy and game industry that have done groundbreaking work for that industry. And just to bring them all together, that was, that equated with like that great picture that they have in Harlem, you know, of the great Renaissance where all these jazz musicians are sitting uh -huh. on the stairs, uh -huh. you know, coming together. We all came together. And this is why I call that documentary that you're referring to as the gathering, right? Uh -huh. And we just had a conversation that was so, so important. And the biggest takeaway from that, there are so many, but one you have already mentioned, and that was from my good friend, Lonnie Johnson, who admonishes parents, right? To see in your child mm -hmm. what they can be mm -hmm. and what you see they will be, right? 
So my biggest takeaway is that each and every one of these young men, as I told their stories, and as I subsequently put a camera in front of all of them and gathered their stories, that there was this seed, there was this seed of, of creative rebellion, right? <laughs> sure. You know, James Couch, uh, John, John, John Couch refers to it as creative rebellion. There's this seed of creative rebellion that the parents were fortunate enough to lay witness to, and they saw, and almost all of these guys' parents went on to encourage them, right? Not to dissuade the, this type of creative rebellion, but to encourage it. And this is why we end up with a Lonnie Johnson and a Ken Johnson and a Elliot Eddy and a Mont Morris, all because their parents saw in them what they can be. And what they saw, these guys became. So... Uh, and overall, it was just a great experience. We are going to be doing, I don't mind letting your audience know, but I will be trying to put together a gathering two. Oh, great. And the gathering two is going to include uh, female uh, pioneers, uh, black pioneers in the toy and game industry. So I have to get a bigger room. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Larger room, and I'll have more visits to make at the airport. So it's uh -huh. going to be exciting. It, it, mm -hmm. it is. It is. Um, one of my... I think one of my favorite one of my favorite stories uh, in it because I'm and I'm pretty sure yeah I'm, I'm very confident it was Lon it was Lonnie uh, was talking about how he was um, experimenting with trying to make rocket fuel in his mom's uh, kitchen yeah. and uh, yeah. almost caught the almost caught the kitchen on fire and he was really worried <laughs> he was really worried about dad coming home and whooping him <laughs> so he put he put on a second pair of pants <laughs> he's That's terrified cool. dad's coming home. And uh, his dad, his dad just calmly says, "Son, you you need to start doing this outside." And 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 buys him like a, a like a portable hop plate so he can actually do the experimentation out outside. And it's like, parents, if you take nothing else from listening to this, like let that story yes. let that story sink in. Let that story sink in, man. And each one of these brothers had that level of storytelling that they could do. And, and it just made it a, uh, a worthwhile moment for me as a film producer. And uh, it, it was just amazing. So, yes, I would encourage your audience to definitely go on YouTube and uh, look at the, uh, the video. It's called The Gathering. Uh, and uh, it's just an amazing, amazing project. I will be. Um, I will for sure be including a, a link in the show notes to that too, so folks will have a thank you and click, thank on, you. click on directly. Um, so my my final question is just uh, so the the Black Universe Hall of Fame is currently virtual, so folks can go and check it out online. Be a be a link uh, in the show notes for that too. Um, but as you mentioned, uh, physical presence is in the works. Uh, mm -hmm. How's that? How's that coming? And how can folks help out? Excellent. It's coming along great. Uh, what I will call swimmingly, literally, we have decided on West Orange. Uh, and West Orange is also the place where Thomas Edison last had his innovation uh, manufacturing facility. Oh, cool. uh, and uh, so our museum will be just up the road from Thomas Edison's museum. And uh, it, uh, it's going to be 38,000 square feet and all the other components that I told you it was going to be. So what we're doing right now is we're in a major fund drive. You know, we're doing a, a major uh, fund drive gala that's going to be called Taking Flight. And we're borrowing the story of Charles Frederick Page. I've already yep. mentioned him. We're borrowing his inspiration. And we're, you know, riding around a gala for that. We're targeting $10 million on that fundraising. And then we have also been uh, approved for uh, funding from the state, uh, which we're uh, supposed to be on the budget for, for this year to, to, garn to garner funds for our uh, capital building program. And I have been uh, pledged by a um, African-American inventor who has countless patents and has made lots and lots of money franchising from his patents. He has pledged $13 million dollars to the project. That's incredible. So yeah. So yeah, we're we're in we're in really uh on a good pace to have this museum built by two late 2026. And uh so that's what we're targeting, late 2026. And if anyone in the listening audience would like to uh, help contribute, 
If you go to our website, there will be a page there where you can go right to programs and support and support the initiative because all of that is so key and so vital to uh, having the capacity to continue to push forward and make sure that this project comes to full fruition. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about, uh, my partner and I, we talk a lot about uh, utilizing a talent, a talent stack. Like what's the, what's the unique set of attributes that you have that you can combine together that differentiate you from almost every, everyone else. And um, I just think it's really cool how you're channeling, how you're channeling yours, you know, into the, into this, mu- into this museum, the historical background met with the the industrial design strengths and, you know, even your, even your penchant for, for film. Um, I just can't wait to see how that all sort of manifests, you know, in, in one, in one place, like what, what a, what a great way to channel your, your interests and passions and abilities, you know, all into, all into one direction like that. It's really cool. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. In the favorite words of uh, Pablo Caleo in The Alchemist, he says to put your desires and your wishes out there and the entire universe will conspire to help you achieve them. And that's what I'm doing now. And, I'm, and, I, and I know that will happen. Those are the laws of attraction. And it's just a matter of time for um, this grand project is there for the world to see and and benefit from. Uh, I don't think we could end on uh, uh, more powerful words than that. So um, thank you. <laughs> that was <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you, James. I uh, really, really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, want to keep the conversation going, um, you know, be happy to have you back on when, um, you know, when, when you guys launch or, you know, talk about another film. So um, yeah, love to keep, love to keep the conversation going and, and thanks for all the work you're doing. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Josh.